We're continuing on in our series here with the fruit of the Spirit. And uh, by now you say, okay, we know what these chairs are about. Well, unless you're a guest with us, then you don't know what these chairs are about. Uh, but I, I just want to review uh, the four kinds of people that we've been talking about when we talk about the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, we have here in the first chair, the natural man. Now, the natural man, I got a little guy up there, he's got nothing inside, he's empty. Uh, the Bible tells us that God set eternity in our hearts. Well, the, we try to fill it with everything. A job, friends, family, uh, entertainment, sports. We try to fill this emptiness inside, but nothing really fills because it's eternity. It's infinite. And the only thing that can really fill it and satisfy it is eternity and infinite, and that is God. And so this person is a person who doesn't have God the... But in contrast to him, there's a guy all the way on the other end. He's the spiritual man. That man is the natural man, the man who, without the spirit. On the other end is the spiritual man. And this person has accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as a Savior, and he's been growing in his walk with Jesus. And you'll notice that inside him I got the tabernacle, okay? It's because his body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And as the, the God would come down and dwell in the tabernacle and the temple of the Old, Old Testament, in the New Testament, our bodies are, are the tabernacle or temple, and God has come down and he's filled us. He's in us, all right? And it says there's the natural man, he is without the spirit, and then there's spiritual man, and uh, then it says that there is the infantile man. You see, you don't just jump from a natural man to being a fully grown, mature, spiritual man. You, you, you go from that state accepting Jesus as Savior, and you're a baby Christian. And, and it says, I could not address you as spiritual, but merely as worldly, as mere infants in Christ, just a baby Christian. Now, when uh, we had newborn babies, uh, I didn't immediately at the hospital throw them the keys and say, hey, drive home, kid. <laughs> Couldn't do it, all right? He had to mature. And, and so it is, a new Christian starts getting the sincere milk of the word. The ABCs in one place, it pretty much calls it, the, the very foundational things of God. And it starts to grow. And the whole idea is to grow into a spiritually mature person. But there's another kind of person. And he says, indeed, you are still not ready for meat, the, the, the strong stuff of the word, because you're still only on the milk. He said, when you ought to be growing, you're sliding back, and he calls them worldly. The word worldly is carnal. It's a carnal person. This person, rather than growing, has received Christ, but rather than growing, they're dabbling back into the old life. You see, it says, if any man's in Christ, he's a new creature. The old is gone, the new has come. But this person is dabbling in the old, and so he kind of straddles the fence. He, he, and so he's not growing at all. In fact, he's going backwards. We have a word for that. We call that backsliding. He's a backslider. All right? Now, I want to relate all that to the, the whole idea of peace. The whole idea of peace. For we know that, as we've been reading, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, peace. Jesus himself said, I leave with you my peace. My peace. I give you my peace. And then he says, I do not, I do not give to you peace as the world gives. There's a huge distinction being made here. Drastic distinction between the spiritual man and the natural man. The world's peace is what Jesus calls it, okay? Not as the world gives. The world's peace, well, actually there is no peace, says my God for the wicked. The guy that's in this chair really has no peace because all he's got is this empty hole. He tries to fill that with everything and, and thinking that surely something will bring me some peace. But even if he's successful and he has the finest car, the finest, the most beautiful wife or a beautiful husband, he, he's got wonderful children and all that, at the very end of the life's journey, he still says, I have no peace because I do not know what the next step is. What is beyond this grave for me? It's a life of no peace. He says, there's no peace for the wicked, uh, says, says my God. But Jesus says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. 
Jesus said, man, I got peace for you. Doesn't matter what your circumstances, where you're at in life, I got peace. This guy has no peace. He tries to fill it and he thinks he's happy because as long as everything's going my way, he feels happy, but, but he doesn't have joy. This guy has joy because he knows no matter what's happening, God has a plan in it and ultimately it's gonna work together for good. I got joy. He has no peace because he's always worried. He's always got peace because all he's gotta do is tap into the source of peace. Drastic difference. But this difference, in fact, is different in three different ways that we're going to see, all right? First of all, there's a drastic difference upward. The upward difference between the spiritual person and the natural person is huge. This person has no peace in reference vertically with God. There's no peace with God. This person goes through their life if they acknowledge that there is a God, that God is out to get me because I know I've blown it in my life. It's not hard to convince somebody that they're a sinner. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's not hard. Have you ever told a lie? If the person says no, what would you say? You liar. <laughs> it's not hard. And so this person knows that at the end of the journey, I, I got to... There's payday someday. It's all got to balance out. There's got to be justice. And, and so this person, they have no peace and they know if they have any God consciousness at all because if they haven't hardened, seared their conscience at all, they know that payday someday, I'm going to have to give an account and, and I don't measure up and there's no peace. There's anxiety, there's anxiousness, there's fear about the future in this person because they know they have no peace with God. In fact, the Bible says they're enemies of God. Enemies. This person's an enemy against God. And God didn't start the fight. You see? God created man perfect. God created man blessed. God, and and God, God did all that. And man rebelled against God. Man started the fight. In Romans, it puts it like this. For those who live according to the flesh, that's this guy, you know, he just lives on the horizontal plane, everything's about the flesh, you see. He's living for himself, he's got all the toys, he's got, you know, uh, he's, he's into all the entertainment, he's doing all the sports, you know. He's got everything, it seems like, and he's trying to fill this emptiness inside. Those who live according to the flesh, look at what he says, they set their minds on things of the flesh, that's all they think about. They don't want to think about this, because this makes them feel guilty, right? And so all they do is they, they fill their mind up with all of this. They think if I fill their mind up with all the stuff here, then that emptiness will go away. But it won't. He says they set their minds on all this fleshly stuff. But he says, but those who live according to the Spirit, they put their mind on things of the Spirit. They get into the Bible, they get into the Word, they do prayer, they meet with the church, uh, they have Christian friends, and, and, and they fellowship, they share their life, they share deeply, intimately, all those kinds of things because they have a community of faith. And, and so that person, they, they mind different, holy, whole, completely different things. But he comes back to this guy, but the carnal man, to be carnally minded, and now, see, remember I talked about the person who accepted Christ, but he's dabbling over here and he's in this carnal chair. He, he he says he's a Christian, but he doesn't live like a Christian because he's dabbling over here. To be carnally minded is death, not peace. I've been saying this. Everybody wants what's in that chair, but you'll never find it over in these chairs. Never. You won't find it. To be carnally minded is death. But he says, to be spiritually minded, to be spiritually minded is peace with God. I have peace with God. You know, we sang that song, It Is Well With My Soul. It Is Well With My Soul. I believe the author of that wrote that because uh, he had lost some family members at sea and he got to the place where uh, they had uh, actually died at sea and he got up the pen and paper and said, It is well with my soul. I had a newborn baby in my first marriage. We had a newborn baby. My, my son Mark lived... 30 minutes. He was, he was born prematurely. He wasn't even the length of my hand. Today, they most likely could have saved his life with the technology today. And uh, so, remember we talked about the good old days? 
those good old days, if they'd been today, he would have lived, okay? Well, in all likelihood. But, but he struggled for every breath that he had. Every breath that he had. And when he finally died, you know, while, that 30 minutes, I was there when he was born, and uh, he was struggling. I, I, I stepped out of the room for a minute, went into the locker room where the doctors changed at the hospital. There was a bench there. I got on my knees and I prayed. I said, I said God, they told me, there's one in a million chance that he can pull through this. I said, God, why don't you make him be the one in the million? That was my prayer. <laughs> okay? God deemed to do otherwise. But you know what? I went back and following week we went to church. And, and uh, a guy came up to me and said, I don't know how you could do it. I would be so angry at God. And all I could think of, it is well with my soul. I got a relationship here. I, I got a God that I know makes no mistakes. He's providentially in control of everything. And, and that I can trust in him. And when you got this vertical thing going, you don't have to be over here to angry on this level because I know that my God, my God, as a God of all comfort, he was giving me something. He said, my grace is sufficient in the time of your need. I needed it then, and he gave it. That's the way it works. But if you're over in these chairs, you don't have that. And even if you say you're a Christian, you're dabbling in this, you don't have it. You're going to see that as we go on. Anyway, he says, this guy over here, he's got peace, peace. All right, peace with God. But this guy over here, these guys over here, he says, because the carnal, the, the carnal mind, this guy, is at enmity, making an enemy of God. They're against God. They blame God. They accuse God. You don't care and all that. That's going on over here. How is it that some Christians, they don't do that? Because they're over here. Those that do this, they're over here. You've got to decide, am I going to grow to become a mature Christian or am I going to slide back to the old way? Do I want that chair or do I want this chair? That's what it comes down to. The carnal mind is at enmity with God for it is not subject to the law of God. It refuses to follow the rules of God. And when you break the rules, you get, suffer the consequences. And so then those who are in the flesh, they cannot please God. Do you realize if you're in one of these two chairs, you can't please God? You've got to get out of these chairs and get moving in a direction towards God if you want God to be pleased. We all say, well, we want to someday hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Then you've got to get out of these chairs. <laughs> you've got to move towards God, being, becoming a, a spiritual person. That's what it's about. If you, the upward difference here is huge. Enemy of God, totally at peace with God. Peace with God. You see, this person... They're the enemy. Now we're shifting. Those who have peace with God. It says, therefore, since we have been justified through faith. As an eight-year-old boy, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior from my sins. Some of you have done it earlier. Some of you have done it later where you made the Jesus your Savior and your Lord. You, you confessed your sins. You called upon him to save you, and he rescued you. He delivered you, and he saved you. It says, that moment, he says, since we have been justified that's a, that's a legal term. That, that's, it means to be declared righteous. God is the judge. And the moment you accept Christ, he makes a pronouncement and he declares you to be righteous. You are acquitted. You're pardoned of all of your sins ever. All my sins were future to the cross, so he pardoned me of all of them. Not the ones I just did years ago and last week or yesterday but also today, tomorrow, next week, I'm forever justified, declared to be righteous. When I accepted Jesus, I moved from this chair to this chair. I was justified through faith. At that very moment, I had peace with God. There's no longer an enemy of God. It was all through my Lord Jesus Christ. He goes on and he says, for if when we were enemies, I used to be an enemy, all right, Everybody used to be an enemy because we were all born sinners, the Bible says. If when we were enemies, we were reconciled, made at peace with God, justified, declared to be pardoned, forgiven of our sins, we were made at peace with God, it says, we were reconciled to him through his death. 
We're reconciled. The word reconcile means to make at peace. There's a, a husband and wife. They're arguing and fighting. They want to get a divorce. And you say, whoa, wait a minute. Let's talk about this. Let's, let's, and, and you get a mediator in there and they reconcile the two. Well, all reconciliation means is you bring to peace, terms of peace. Bring to terms of peace. We used to be enemies against God, fighting. We used to be over nature. And then I accepted Jesus and we came to terms of peace. Through him, and it says through the death of his son. You see, it was Jesus on the cross that paid all my debt. Every sin that I'd ever committed, ever will commit, was paid for. And on the cross, he cried out, it is finished. The Greek word means to be paid in full. He paid in full for all my sins. So I moved from this chair to the infantile chair, and I started growing in my faith. And when I grow, I'm, I'm moving to the spiritual man. And when I, and I've had periods in my life where I step back, I move into this chair. Over here, I'm telling you, there is no peace. But when I'm in this chair and moving in this direction, I have peace. I have peace with God. If he says, for how much more, having been reconciled, been brought to peace, shall you also be saved through his life? Oh, my goodness. There's salvation. That's what salvation is about. Taking you from no peace to complete peace. What a difference. No peace, peace. Enemies of God, Reconciled to God. So what we have here, upwardly, the Christian has a peace. The world has no peace. All right. Next is the inward peace. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. So what do they have? Worry. Anxiety. Fear. Care, fretting, goes on and on. But Jesus said, do not worry. Do not worry. When you're worrying, you have no peace. He says, do not worry, saying, what shall I eat, or what shall I drink, or what shall I wear? The basic things of life. He says, don't worry about that stuff. For the pagan, that's the person who is the natural man without Christ, he's empty. The pagan runs after all these things, and your father knows that you need them. So what you say is, Dad, uh, I often do this. I say, hey, Lord, your servant has a need here. <laughs> I'm just reminding you, Dad. Father in heaven, I'm just reminding you that I have a need here. And don't... I'm just letting you know, and then I let him take care of it because he's my father. He's my father. Over here, they beg, borrow, steal, do whatever they got to do because they're on their own, horizontal. They worry, worry, worry. Jesus gives us the peace of God. We have peace with God. We're no longer enemies, but now we need that peace in our hearts, okay, within, inside. And this is what, what it says in Philippians. It says, do not be anxious or worry about anything. But in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding. Can I put that in modern translation? It blows your mind. <laughs> the peace of God will blow your mind. That's what I'm saying. There I was, we'd lost a baby, and, and, and we had peace in our heart that God is sovereign, knows what he's doing. And... and a man in the church is saying, I'd be so angry with God. You know what's so cool about that? Our doctor saw how we handled that situation. About a couple months later, he calls us up on the phone and he says, because um, we were trying to be foster parents, he calls up and he says, you know what? Um, I have a young lady. So first of all, he says, I will give you the highest recommendation I can for you being foster parents because we'd asked him to fill out some forms. He said, but how would you like to adopt instead? So I have, a, I have a son that we've adopted. Because he saw not the worldly, no peace, but he saw somebody that really had peace. And he said, you know, people like that, got that kind of peace, I think they make good parents. You see what's going on here? God works everything together for good. He, he gave me a son, all right? I had the peace of God 
in, in a terrible circumstance, and God rewarded with, me with, for that. But I have the peace of God. Over here, there's no peace. Which chair you want to be in? You want to be in the right chair. He says, humble yourself, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. And that's exactly the story I just told you. He lifted up and gave an answer in due time. He says, cast all your care on him because he cares for you. Somebody said that most of us Christians are Indian givers. I don't know where that ever came up from. That whole term, Indian giver, you know, where you give it and then you take it back. You'd think it would have been well, not the Indians, but the other side, because we kept taking their land away and then moving them and then taking their land away. Anyway, the Indian givers were, you give something to somebody and then you take it back. When it comes to our cares, that's what we tend to do. We tend to give them to God in prayer and then soon as they say, hey God, I'm going to take that with me now. <laughs> and and I, 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 it's like, oh yeah, I gave that to you, but I, no, I didn't give that to you. I'm, a, I'm still going to worry about it. No, the whole idea is that you give it to God and you say, I'm not going to worry about that anymore. God, it's, in your, you, it's your worry now. He cares for you. He cares for you. And that brings us this huge inward peace. Now, then there's this outward peace. Because it is true. This guy, that's all he looks for is the outward peace. But outward peace to the world just means less conflict and war. That's all it means. Less conflict and war is peace. Uh, in the last 5,600 years, there have been only 292 years of peace. And I, I got it charted there. That's the number of years of war going on somewhere on planet Earth versus the number of years of peace. And most of those aren't years. Those are little, you know, portions of a year, a few months here or there, and they start to add up. Okay. In fact, let's just get contemporary. There have only been a total of 194 actual wars between 1945 and 2001. <laughs> That's actual war here on planet Earth since we started the United Nations to help us have peace in the world. And that does not include the more than 3,000 different disputes that went on since 1945, nor does it include since 2001, and that's, you know, when the, the World Trade Center was hit. Uh, that doesn't include Iran, Iraq, uh, Afghanistan. It doesn't include, uh, I mean, you just go on. You see, so the world settles, their whole idea of peace is just less war or manageable war or acceptable casualties. That's the world's peace. All right? Yeah, that, that's Jesus' peace, even politically, is so different. Now, we don't have time now to go through what the Bible teaches about the end times, but sometime we'll do a class on end time studies from the Bible prophecy. And, but politically speaking, there's going to be a time in the future, it's a thousand years long, it's called the millennium, it's a millennial kingdom where Jesus returns and he rules on planet Earth in Jerusalem, he is a priest and a king on his throne, according to Zechariah. And he sits there, and he's got a, a, he rules with a, a, a rod of iron. And so law is enforced, but there are no wars for a thousand years. There are no conflicts for a thousand years, and there are no casualties for a thousand years. Is that great? Now, you've got the world's peace. Uh, we just acceptable casualties? No casualties. Wars and rumors of wars? No war. Come on, what are you kidding? Which one do you want? Which one do you want? Outwardly speaking, it's like this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and he has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To be reconciled is to make peace. God has given us, you and me, the ministry of making peace. That's what we're about. We're peacemakers. We're peacemakers. Upwardly, we have peace with God. Inwardly, we have the peace of God. Outwardly, we're the peacemakers of God. We're the ones that are bring peace. We're the ones. Our means of bringing peace is the message of the cross. It's this, he says, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. God is trying to make peace with you. Because you're so stubborn that you don't want to do it. You're raising, you're at enmity with God. 
that he sent his son to die in your place, and he said, just accept the terms of peace. Accept Jesus as your Savior, and you're at peace with God, and if you'll start to grow in your faith, you'll receive the peace of God so that you then can share that message with others and become peacemakers that they find peace with God and the peace of God. You see what I'm saying? Means of our cross. He goes on and he says in this passage, our message is reconciliation. Be reconciled to God. That's God has committed to us a message of reconciliation. We're to tell other people about our faith. We're to be sharing. We're to so live our lives that they see our peace and they say, what is the reason of hope that you have? That they actually ask us questions. And then we're to be prepared to say, well, this is why, because Jesus Christ is my Savior. I gave it to him and he took care of it. I mean, we just tell them the message. We go on in this passage, and he says, we actually implore people, be at peace with God. That's a preacher's job, right? No, it's all of our job. I'm telling you, be at peace with God. Come to know Jesus as Savior. Move yourself from these chairs. Get into the spiritual chair. Commit your heart and your life to Jesus. Live for Jesus. You will have peace, all these peace. Remember that passage we read a moment ago, do not be anxious about anything but in everything by prayer. Prayer is our method. We pray for peace. By prayer and petitions, thanksgiving, you present your request to God, and somehow, mind-blowing in, in its capacity, God sends peace in your heart, and you are tranquil. It doesn't matter what's going on around you. You have a peace from God deep down inside. It transcends all understanding. It blows your mind. And notice what it says. We'll guard your hearts and keep your mind. The word guard there is uh, set up like a garrison of soldiers around your heart. God, when, when, you, when, you, when you move into this chair and you're really giving it over to God and you've handed it over, it's, it's your problem, God, not mine. He sets up this garrison around your heart, protects your heart and your mind and so that you you know, you know what it's like when you're sleepless, you can't sleep because the thing keeps playing over and over and over and again in your mind? And you've really finally let it go, you're off to sleep. You gave it to him. It's gone. He guides your minds. We go on just a little bit further. The Bible tells us we are to be reconciled to our brothers. We're to be reconciled here in the family of God. We're to be peacemakers within the church. We're to... There should not be anything between us. If there's something between us, we make it right before we, we, we worship. And it says, if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. You mean my next door neighbor? <laughs> you bet. You mean that guy that just cut me off on the road? I can't go by and give him the good old Italian salute? Make every effort to be in peace with all men. Every effort. Now, you know why he says that? If possible, every effort. Because some people make it their full-time occupation to make your life miserable. And you make every effort. You cannot make them be at peace with you. You cannot. Because you're over in this chair. They only see it this way. They only see it all about me. Uh, they're not coming for where you're at. This is all for the glory of God. Uh, and so they're making life as miserable as they can for you, and you try as best you can to be at peace with everyone. But you can't always be at peace with everyone because not everyone will reciprocate peace with peace. Let me just sum this all up. You can have upward peace with God. You accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you have peace with God. You can have inward peace, the peace of God, when you begin to grow in your faith and you really learn to turn it all over to him. He will give you a peace deep within your heart. You can have outward peace with others as much as possibly is if you just try to make peace with others in every capacity. And so where do you get all of this from? Listen, I'm telling you, it goes all the way back to the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit is what the Holy Spirit produces. The fruit of the Spirit is love Joy, peace. I'm telling you, folks, you never find it in these two chairs. You only find the fruit. 
when you're moving from this chair to this chair or in this chair, when, when you're walking in the Spirit. You're living in the Spirit. You're depending on the Spirit. You're taking the Word of God and you're applying it into your life and saying, listen, Holy Spirit, is this the way I should be responding to this situation? And you're in tune with the Spirit of God. You're in tune with Christ. You're asking Jesus, hey, what would you do, Jesus? That's what I want to do. And you're living your life. When you start doing that, everything will change. Everything will change. Because the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, peace. Now, I'm sorry that you're going to have to wait, and that means patience a whole week till we deal with the next fruit of the Spirit, which is patience. 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 Next week.